In this video, I want to talk about homeostasis and how homeostasis is connected to maintaining normal metabolic and physiological function. All that means is how basically metabolic means how fast our chemical reactions occur, and physiological means how fast or how good our body is working. Right, so basically, how does homeostasis help us to do chemical reactions at the normal rates, and how does it help us to maintain normal function of our body? So homeostasis is the idea of keeping everything constant, because for example, when it comes to our temperature, remember we need to keep it constant at about 37 degrees Celsius, and that's a normal body temperature. So it doesn't stay there by itself, it will change, occasionally it will go up and down a tiny bit, but we do have mechanisms that allow us to bring it back to that set point. So for example, if we have it 37 initially, but it might go up a little, it might go up too much, we can sweat, the response will be sweating, that brings it back down again. Same with when it comes to low, then we can start shivering, that brings it back up. Right, so these are the two responses that maintain our actual temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. And with pH, same idea. If we have it too high, that means we can have a response to bring it back down. If we have it too low, we have a response to bring it back up. And that makes sure we can keep our pH in the blood between 7 to 8, so in a very fine limit. That's the idea of homeostasis. Everything is kept at a very fine limit. And the example of the aircon would be another thing that actually does that same kind of mechanism. Because the aircon has, let's say we want to keep our room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius. And we want to keep that at 20. So what happens if, if it goes up too high, then our actual aircon will blow more cold air, which will bring it back to that set point. If it goes too low, it will stop blowing cold air and bring it back up to that set point. So these two mechanisms, these two responses are there to control room temperature. But why does our body actually want to keep 37 degrees Celsius? What's the point? What's the reason behind that? Or why does it want to keep a pH of 7? That's what we're going to discuss now because it's connected to something called enzymes. Enzymes are made up of protein, and these proteins are basically a chain of amino acids. So you can see this is here as an example of an enzyme, and you can see that's a protein, and those little balls are amino acids. That's what an enzyme is. And this is how we often draw enzymes. Not scientifically correct, but it helps us illustrate how they work. What they actually do is they work as biological catalysts, and what that means is they speed up the metabolic rate, what the metabolic rate is just the rate of chemical reactions. So basically, the enzymes make sure the chemical reactions occur a lot faster than they would usually occur. One example would be cell respiration. So here we have chemical reaction with carbohydrates such as glucose and oxygen coming together. So these are the reactants that come together to form carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And this reaction wouldn't occur fast enough without end with enzymes. We need enzymes to make sure this, this chemical reaction actually occurs at a fast enough rate to produce enough energy for us to be able to survive. Without enzymes, it would still go ahead, but not fast enough. Right, so that's the idea of enzymes. And how they actually work in detail would be something like this. We have something called substrates. These substrates are what we start with. This is for the uppercase of carbohydrates and oxygen. They would come together and lock on to something called an enzyme. And the enzyme basically makes whatever is meant to happen, it makes it happen a lot faster. So in this case, these two substrates are meant to come together to form a product, which is the final thing. In this case, A and B will come together to form one big block, and the enzyme just makes it happen a lot faster, right? As, as would usually happen. And we call the beginning the substrate, the end the product, and the enzyme itself, this part here is the enzyme substrate complex, and this is where all the action happens. So that's what you should need to what you should know. And you should also know that something can happen if this is these actually fit into the enzyme perfectly. So substrate fits into the enzyme perfectly, and every substrate can only be broken down by one specific type of enzyme. And you should also know that if that shape changes, that means the actual enzyme won't work as good as it should because it doesn't fit perfectly. And that's what we're going to talk about now. What happens when that happens? What happens to how fast these actually operate? Because you can actually do an experiment in class, and it's called the enzyme activity experiment. All you might be doing is you might be using different types of um, substrates. In this case, I'm going to use a milk protein as my substrate. So you can see we've put the milk protein, um, basically a milk kind of liquid, into all of these um, test tubes. These are all meant to be test tubes. So this, this liquid uh, has milk protein, but they're all aqueous, they're all dissolved, so we can't see them. But we're going to put a into three of them, we're going to put an enzyme renin. So these three here have the enzyme renin and the substrate, whereas the other ones don't have the enzyme, which means that the control, what we expect, it, because these are the control, we don't expect anything to happen or not much to happen, because without the actual enzyme, remember enzymes speed up chemical reactions, and what will happen if the actual enzyme is present is these um, test tubes will become clumpy, because these enzymes break down that milk protein to make it into clumpy milk protein. So we're not expecting anything to happen in the first 
three test tubes because there are no enzymes in there. But we do expect something to happen in the other three test tubes because there are enzymes and substrates in those ones. What we're going to find is we're going to find more happening in the middle one. We're going to find much of that milk going clumpy, whereas less milk is going to go clumpy in the ones in, at 10 degrees Celsius and the ones at 7 degrees Celsius. The one that has going to have most activity is at, one at 37 degrees Celsius. And the reason why is because we have optimum activity or optimum temperatures for every single enzyme. They have different types of optimum um, temperatures depending on the enzyme. But for example, renin itself works best at 37 degrees Celsius. So what you're going to see, we've got enzyme activity on one side, temperature on the other side. If you've basically plotted that whole graph of what we just did, you'd find that it works highest. Highest activity would be at 37, and at 10 degrees it would be lower, and at 7 degrees it would also be lower, because if you go at either end of that spectrum, the activity of the enzyme decreases. And the reason is because the enzyme becomes less active. The enzyme denatures, which means it can't break down things as fast as it used to. The same happens with pH. If we change that pH, if we test for pH, which means we're changing the pH, um, then we see the same thing here. We test for temperature, but we can also change for pH, and we find the same thing. In this, in this case, the enzyme would be working best at a pH of 7, and if we decrease it at either spectrum, we would decrease the activity of the enzyme. And that's the reason why we want to keep everything the same, a constant internal environment, to make sure our enzymes work properly. And that increases our metabolic activity. And again, the way this is done is through homeostasis. This is the mechanism that allows us to keep everything constant. And there's two stages, there's detection and there's response. So for example, again, we have a set point, so let's imagine it's 37 degrees Celsius. So we want to keep it just at the same point the whole time. Every now and then, there might be an increase, right? And once there's an increase, we must bring it back down. That's, that's a decrease back to that, that set point. So that increase, if there's an increase, we call that the stimulus. Stimulus is just any, any change in the actual temperature in this case. And um, once that is a stimulus, we need to detect it. Our body needs to be able to detect it. And it's done by receptors. And then it needs to bring it back down. And it's done by response. For example, in this case, it's gone too high. So it might be sweating. Uh, so sweating would be an example of what we do when the temperature is too high. And we want to bring it back down. That's a response. And shivering is the opposite. It's a response we have when the temperature is too low. We want to bring it back up. But both of these have to have a detection happen first. We have to detect the change for us to be able to change it. Right? So... This is what I mean by thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is the idea of homeostasis and it being able to maintain a temperature. This is how it works in our body. So for example, we have our normal body temperature being set at about 37 degrees Celsius. This is what we want to maintain. If there's an increase in the body temperature, if it goes up for any, any reason, that's a stimulus, right? That's a change in the environment. That will be picked up first by receptors. These receptors called thermoreceptors will pick up the change. Then it will send a signal on through neurons, messenger neurons. And they will send that signal onto the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the control center. It's part of our brain here. And the control center will decide what to do. And it will send a signal onto the effectors, which are the ones that will make the response happen. In this case, it will send a signal onto the sweat gland or the blood vessels. And they will dilate. The blood vessels will dilate. And the sweat glands will produce sweat. That's a response. And all this is done to make sure we lose more body heat, bring our temperature back down again. So we've got all these mechanisms, and what, all I mentioned earlier, the receptors, the mesh neurons, the hypothalamus are all part of the nervous system, which shows you that the nervous system is quite important in this whole mechanism. But what I just, what I just briefly went over is just the idea of thermoregulation, the idea that we can maintain our own body temperatures, and that's done to control, um, keep constant, which means we have a constant internal environment, and that's good for, for example, metabolic function for enzymes. And there's a couple of animals that can actually do this. For example, the red kangaroo is called an endotherm. Endo means inside, therm means temperature. These can control their own temperature, their internal temperature for this through different mechanisms. So they do homeostasis. So endotherms do homeostasis. And um, some of the ones that actually belong in there, again, is a red kangaroo. One, of, one thing that it can do, it can lick its paws. When it licks its paws, there's basically evaporation that happens from the water, that, from the spit, that's the lick, the licking part. And that will cool the blood below its paws and thereby cool its whole body. Right? So if it licks its paws, it will decrease its temperature, and it does that when it's too hot. So when it's too hot outside, it will lick its paws to bring it back down to normal. And it can also hop around more. When it hops around more, its muscles become more active, and those muscles will produce more heat, which means the temperature goes back up. So if it's too cold, it will hop around to be able to produce more heat. And then the ectotherm is something that is, can't control its own temperature. Ecto means outside. So basically, whatever the outside temperature or the ambient temperature is, it's also going to be its inside temperature. An example of this would be the blue tongue lizard. So it can only use the environment to be able to control its temperature. It can't use its internal 
body. So for example, it can seek shade, so it can try to find some shelter, some, some shade. And the reason why is because that area is less heated, there's less heat there. So it will do this if it's really hot outside. And if by going into less hot area, basically, it will decrease the body temperature because that new area is, is less hot, hot than maybe the initial sun area would have been. And if it's too cold outside, what it can do is it can move on to hot rock. And then hot rock will basically um, allow the blue tongue lizard to absorb that heat and thereby increase the body temperature by absorbing the heat from the hot rock. But again, these two examples are examples of the environment being used to control, not the actual internal structures. And also we have the eucalyptus tree. This would be an example of a plant that's in Australia. And they also have some mechanisms to be able to allow them to control their actual body temperature, uh, their leaf temperature and the temperature inside. So for example, their, heat, their leaves are um, hanging vertically. That means they're hanging downwards. And that's done because it allows less exposure to of sun to be on the leaf. So only parts of the actual leaf are going to be exposed to sun which means less heating up than if it were basically straight. Another thing that happens is that you have these narrow leaves, and narrow leaves basically allow only a tiny bit of sun exposure, as opposed to a broader leaf, which would have more sun exposure. Again, the more sun exposure, the more heating up. So these are two mechanisms that plants can do, to be as the eucalyptus tree does, to be able to absorb less heat, to be able to survive in the hot, straight climate. But this was just a quick introduction in terms of the next 12 videos. It will cover all these concepts in much more detail. So even if you don't fully get the actual content, that's fine. We'll cover all this in much more detail in a second. I hope that was useful.